Welcome to the Voices of Veterinary Medicine podcast. I'm Dr. K, small animal veterinarian and author, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information from a wide variety of interesting people working within the field of veterinary medicine so you can learn from their experiences and proactively steer your career to happiness and fulfillment. And before we get started, I'd just like to remind you that for less than the cost of a bag of pepperoni dog snacks, you could support the Voices of Veterinary Medicine by going to patreon.com forward slash Voices of Vet Med, or visit my website at www.realize.vet, that's R-E-A-L-I-Z-E dot V as in Victor, E, T as in Tom. Just click on the podcast tab, and there you will see the link for Patreon. Your support helps pay for server hosting and production, and it tells me you find value in the show and want to see it continue. Patreon supporters get access to a bonus monthly recording about current issues in veterinary medicine and can submit questions that will be answered in depth in these bonus monthly episodes that are for Patreon supporters only. And I thank you in advance for your consideration of supporting the show, and I'm so glad to have you here. And here's the show. Dr. Carrie Lajeunesse is a healer and teacher advancing health and well-being for people and animals around the world. As owner of La Jeune Consulting, she brings together and collaborates with people of diverse backgrounds and interests, contributing her expertise in the biomedical sciences, thanatology, which is the study of death, dying, and bereavement, traumatic stress, spirituality and culture, communications, ethics, and crisis and risk management. Currently based in the Pacific Northwest, her work as a corporate consultant, policy advisor, coach, counselor, and leader in nonprofit organizations has taken her across North America and to Africa, Europe, Southeast Asia, and Central America. Her prior leadership positions include serving as president of the Washington State Veterinary Medical Association, being a program manager for Veterinarians Without Borders, U.S. Director on the Board of the Northwest Association for Biomedical Research, Strategic Advisor for Veterinarians International, as well as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship in the U.S. Congress. She sits on the Council of Advisors for the One Health Commission and serves as pro bono advisor and strategist for policymakers and leaders in other nonprofit organizations. She is also a commissioned spiritual director. Dr. La Jeunesse received her BS in zoology in 1979 and her DVM in 1983 from the University of California, Davis. She practiced primarily companion animal emergency and critical care medicine for 30 years. She holds certificates in thanatology through the Association for Death Education and Counseling, Compassion Fatigue Education through the Green Cross Academy of Traumatology, and Global Health Strategies for Security through the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Carrie Lajeunesse. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, April. I'm so excited to be able to interview somebody with such diverse experience. I feel like I feel like I'm a little grasshopper <laughs> compared to you. <laughs> Everything that you've done and seen and the things that you're doing now, I feel like you you operate in a universe that I know very little bit a little about. So, I'm excited to have the opportunity for you to share your experiences with people who may want to follow in your footsteps or just gain something from the experiences that you've had as they follow their own paths. But um you you graduated in 1983 with your DVM, and before that, you got a, a BS in zoology at University of California, Davis. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the BS in zoology? I don't know much about what, what that degree uh, encompasses. And Well, I'm not sure what it encompasses now, because that was a very long time ago. But I think, in general, it was a very broad overview, uh, overview of the life sciences with an emphasis on animal life. So I think one of my favorite classes, for instance, was evolutionary ecology, where we learned about how organisms adapt to their environment. And I think that was my first exposure to the concept of adaptability and resilience. Um, so that that was 
the piece of zoology that I loved best was learning about life forms, learning, learning about them in comparison to other life forms and their environment. And of course, humans are an animal, so they were part of that learning all along the way as well. And was that when you um, decided that you wanted to go into veterinary medicine because of your courses in zoology or had you made that decision previously? So I probably had made that decision in a, in a approximate way much before then. I would identify myself as somebody who was sort of an intuitive healer from a very young age and I loved people and medicine and science and animals and so that ended up being the most logical place I think for me to go. I did look at law, I looked at oceanography, uh, I looked at human medicine and I think by the time I had gotten to college where I was deciding where I was going to go, uh, whether it was basic science research and genetics or veterinary medicine ultimately ended up being the final decision. It was impacted by this idea of working with humans, animals, and medicine and science. If I'd not been able to get into veterinary school, then I would have applied to human medical school. <laughs> That's funny. Because even today, it's still harder to get into veterinary school than medical school. Right. Numbers, right? It's a numbers game. <laughs> right, right. And you mentioned in a previous conversation that we'd had that there was somebody um, in your undergraduate career that was a huge influence on you. Did you want to talk a little bit about? about yeah. That? So Dr. Ralph Kitchell was a professor in the Department of Anatomy and Physiology, I believe was the name of the department at the time at the University of California Davis Veterinary School, and he had been a former dean at Kansas State and Iowa State University Colleges of Veterinary Medicine. I think I had no clue at the time the stratospheric excellence of the people that I worked for, heads of radiology departments and heads of soft tissue surgery and, and Dr. Kitchell. And Dr. Kitchell was one of the kindest, most ethical, most generous people I've ever met. And I think I've carried that moral stance with me and his guidance with me. And also he was one of the first people that really recognized, I think, the essence of who I was and was able to speak directly to what my talents were and what my challenges were and help me navigate that. He's also the first person that taught me how to calm down and maintain my um, thoughtfulness and skill in a crisis. I was doing surgery and I accidentally sliced into a femoral artery and of course there was a blood bath and he happened to walk in the door right at that time and walked me through that and that was a lesson learned that I carried with me for the rest of my life and has been very, very instrumental in my ability to navigate emergencies and crises. So very grateful to him for that. Oh my amazing goodness. human, amazing human being. And interestingly, that was really my first exposure on this topic of suicide in veterinary medicine and mental health issues comes up. Dr. Kitchell had come to UC Davis to take a position that was vacated after the person before him had died by suicide in the lab. So this, this was my first exposure to that and being aware of the issues around the stressors that we face in our profession. So the previous dean of UC Davis. Um, no, 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 no. This was just somebody in the, the, not just somebody, this was somebody in the anatomy department oh. that had died by suicide and, and Dr. Kitchell replaced that person. So oh. that was, a, he spoke um, to the importance of taking care of each other and taking care of ourselves and as the primary foundation for everything we do. So I was grateful for that. Not so happy to hear about the suicide, but grateful for the perspective that that brought in the learning. Right. And was uh, the person, that person, uh, a DVM? Yes. Well, I, actually, I don't remember they were DVM, but they were a professor in the anatomy department at Davis. Okay. okay. So having that experience of slicing through the femoral artery, that's a big <laughs> deal. Right. Well, and this was as an undergrad, too. So I didn't realize the experience I got surgically. I was placing catheters and doing laminectomies and cannulating carotid and femoral arteries as a way to get prepared for the for the research that we were doing. And uh, yeah, so I learned a lot from Dr. Kitchell about, OK, stay calm, you know, hold it off so it doesn't bleed. And then we can as long as it's not bleeding, we've got time to come up with a plan and be calm and center ourselves so that we can do a good job. And that's benefited me in all the mentoring and teaching I do as well. It's, mm -hmm. easy, it's easy to lose focus and become less skilled when we're nervous and upset. So 
That is for sure. And that is something that I remember admiring so much about my surgical professors uh, at Virginia Tech is uh, because one of them nicked, I think, the, the popliteal artery while doing right. surgery. And it was the blood was spurting everywhere like a volcano of blood. And she was just cool as a cucumber. No big deal. It's OK. Great, great modeling, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but much easier said than done. <laughs> so then um, you you got into veterinary school, UC, UC Davis, and tell me what, what was that transition like from undergraduate uh, to uh, veterinary school? And like, what were your general perceptions of veterinary school while you were there? So I think in a way I was lucky in that I had worked at the veterinary school, both in research labs and in the clinics. In my undergrad, my, in my two undergrad years at Davis, so I did two years at a community college first and then transferred to Davis. So we can talk community college a little bit if you'd like to. So I already had, first of all, a great support network. I had people that cared about me all the way from radiology technicians and, and veterinary technicians to house officers and heads of departments. And I, I again, I probably didn't fully appreciate the excellence of the people I work with and all the, and also the, the challenges they presented to me to, to help me be as good as I could be. So I, I didn't appreciate that fully until later on. So if there's any word of advice I have is if you can really stop to pause and think about the people who are mentoring you and appreciate that in the moment, you might get more out of it and, and also carry with you the understanding that you might have special knowledge or skills or talents that you've cultivated early on that maybe other people don't have and to learn how to share those experiences with one another. So the transition for me, honestly, it's hard to remember, but I think it was pretty seamless. I think the social aspects of it, uh, finding a way to navigate, as it turns out, I had a little bit of a learning disability and Again, didn't figure that out till many years later when my own kids were being evaluated for those. So finding out a way to navigate the different type of course load in vet school compared to undergrad where I already had sort of a learning process in place was a bit of a challenge, but it worked out well. And also, to I needed a touchstone in things outside of veterinary school, and I'd already established that. So whether that was sports and recreational activities or... Um, community events or exercise. I, I was from Southern California, so couldn't body surf, but I could roller skate and play frisbee, and I did that every chance I got. So those those types of things help with that transition. And I think honestly, it was such an immersion. Um, I was lucky in that I had my lab right attached to the vet school, so I could run in and out of the lab to kind of get away from things and study without having to go to a library or go all the way home. So I was really fortunate. I think it was easier for me in some ways than it might have been for other people. So did you continue working uh, in, in the laboratory while you were a veterinary student? Right. So I did several different things. I worked for uh, Dr. Kitchell in the neuroanatomy lab. And then following that, I worked for a doctor who did neuropharmacology research, Dr. Gerald Ling. So I was doing surgeries. And I think at the time, probably what we were working on was Batrol, was, was doing initial clinical testing for Batrol and pharmacologic studies, physiopharmacologic studies for that. So I worked through the first part of my senior year of that school. And then I was clear it just got to be too much to manage. Also, I was the first female student rep to the California Veterinary Medical Association. And so that was really fun, but it took a lot of time. They had frequent meetings and a fair amount of travel. So I just decided towards the end of my, I think it was the first quarter of my, my uh, senior year of that school that work was going to have to go away for a little while in order to, to finish up that school properly. Hmm. So all of this had you had started building when you began your under undergraduate career, like you you went for these jobs uh, working in laboratories and working with professors and research projects. Right. How, right and, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. How did you go about getting those jobs? Did you just walk up to these professors and say, hello, I'm Harry? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, yes and no. So prior to that, I'd worked since I was about 14 years old and had a bit of entrepreneurship in, in that I 
taught piano lessons to beginning students when I was in high school and did some other stuff. So I, I've been raised in a way that said, look, if you want to do something, there's usually a way to figure out how to do it. So I already knew how to make a resume. I worked in a bank. I, I worked in a pet store. I taught piano lessons. I worked in a scuba shop, had a bunch of great experiences in all of these places. And I'm one of those really lucky people. I have loved every job I've ever had. Not all the circumstances contained within those jobs, but I've always loved the work that I've done. And so being able to take these skills I had cultivated in all of these different jobs, including my experience working with various practitioners prior to that school, and shape that into a message that could say to somebody, here's what I want to learn, um, what you think I should learn, and here's how I could be valuable to you after I'd researched what they need, was important in that messaging. Back in those days, part of financial aid was the ability to do work study. So, we could do work study. There was a listing of jobs available in certain departments. And what I ended up finding out happening, my first job at UC Davis was in the anatomy department making bone boxes and skeletons. So it's kind of a gross job, fleshing out cadavers and putting the bones in lye tanks and cleaning them up and all that. But because of the work that I did and the enthusiasm I showed for learning, a job was created for me in Dr. Kitchell's lab. So making your own opportunities sometimes can happen as well. I was lucky. I'm very, very lucky with the jobs I have. Very lucky. Fantastic. So you just started wherever there was an opportunity. And, and sometimes there. it was gross, you know, cleaning cages, flushing out dogs. But, but you learn, you know, you, if you work with good people, you have an opportunity to learn just about everywhere you are. Right. And you had the opportunity to impress them with your enthusiasm and uh, joy for whatever it was you were doing. I, and, you know, it's funny, I don't think I thought about impressing them because I think I didn't have that much self-esteem at that point to think about. I was just so excited about what I was doing and felt so privileged to be there that I think enthusiasm can, can make a big difference, especially when you're working with other people who are equally passionate about what they do. They want to work with other people who care about the same things. That's true. That's true. And you showed, I presume, some curiosity in, in them and what they were doing. And I'm sure they appreciated that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so funny story to me, at least. So I was working on a, cada a dog cadaver and um, came across something in the bladder. So I feel this hard thing in the bladder. So I open it up and I pull out something that looks like a stone. And so I walked over to the lab and I said, I said, Dr. Kitchell, I found this in a dog's bladder. What is it? He goes, well, what does it look like? I said, it looks like a stone or a rock. He goes, where was it? I said, it was in the bladder. And he says, so what is it? I'm like, a bladder rock? <laughs> 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 he says, a bladder stone. So that, that was my first exposure to um, urolithiasis. And I, to this day, I have that stone. I kept that stone. Oh, only my gosh. I, only of the, of the many, many stones I've removed surgically, that's the only one I've kept in my career. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Did you make a pendant out of it? <laughs> I did not. It just it just sits in one of my little um, inspirational areas, let's put it. Let's, it it's, it's a thing about that, that place where, you know, humility and somebody's expert. I mean, he never said to me, like, what kind of an idiot are you? You don't know it's a stone in a bladder. He just had this lovely way of walking me through that and having me figure it out on my own. So it has, has deep meaning for me on many different levels. Wow. I, I love that story. Now, when you were in veterinary school, and, and um, I think you alluded to this a little bit in, in that um, the demographics of veterinary students have changed drastically since you were a student versus when I was a student. And when I was in vet school, I think it was probably 80% women and 20% men in my class. What was it like in your class in terms of so my class, I believe, was the first class, it was just about 50% men and 50% women. So that, that was certainly an interesting transition. And, and I think at the time, the profession and the vet schools weren't, and I'm not sure they're there yet, obviously, but I, certainly not in a position to know how to navigate all of the tensions around that gender shift. So it was a very interesting time to be there. And I remember when I was when I went to my first California Veterinary Medical Association meeting as a first female representative, there was there was this moment where some of the board members just like 
kind of didn't know what to do with me. And that dissolved away. And that I'm so fortunate that that became my first exposure to uh, working as a leader in organizations. I'd done 4-H and FFA and some other stuff before that, but working as a leader in organizations, California VMA at that time was one of the most spectacular places to do that. And the executive assistant at the time remains a very dear friend of mine and recently just moved to my hometown. So we've, we've stayed connected over almost four years now. Wow. Very exciting. Yeah. And why? Why was it such a great experience, leadership experience? Because they included me as a peer and, you know, put me into positions where I had to stretch myself and be thoughtful and also supported me in being able to speak up. At that time, there was a conversation going on in California. And looking back on this, it's, it's kind of humorous now, but at the time, it wasn't funny at all. They felt that there was going to be an oversupply of veterinarians. So there was an ongoing discussion in the California Veterinary Medical Association's sort of house of delegates, for lack of a better description, about what they were going to do and the solution um, that was being put forward was, well, let's get everybody through vet school, but let's just make the licensing exam so difficult that not that many people can pass it. And of course, and, and so here I am, this you know, junior veterinary student, and I have, and that's what they called us back then. They didn't call us third years, they called us juniors, so pardon my, my obvious generational lapse there. So I had to find the voice to speak up in this room of, you know, 100 people, don't remember what it was, say, hey, I understand you think this is an issue, but that's not the place to limit people being able to get into the profession. They've incurred debt, they've got hopes and dreams up, they've invested all this time. So if you you want to have a bit of a lag time, then just accept fewer people to the school. Of course, they didn't want to do that because that was you know, taxes and money for the school. So anyway, eventually that got resolved, but but that ability to speak up and to thoughtfully craft a persuasive argument and present that in a civil way that considered other people's fears and opinions was great foundation for what I did moving forward. And I came from a, a family of communicators. My mom was a communications major, my sister was, and my dad was a, an FBI agent who's a fabulous investigator and communicator. So I've been steeped in how to do that. But putting that into action was difficult, and I couldn't have done it without the support of the folks in the California Veterinary Medical Association. They were great. So I'm just curious, what was the solution to this perceived overabundance of veterinarians? So there were a few years where the, where the licensing exam, and you probably heard rumors about the California licensing exam, it's extraordinarily difficult and I think remains one of the most difficult exams to pass. So there were a few years where they were navigating that. And then I think as they started looking at some economic studies and really went back and looked at economic growth, the fears around competition and how to navigate that gave way to how do we practice effectively, how do we market, how do we train employees retain employees very similar discussions to to what we have going on now it's I, I don't know that that landscape has changed that much I think that we just learn more effective ways to address the the fears that people had about losing their livelihoods or not making as much money and so veterinarians as a rule don't get trained at least back in that day, unless it was an elective course, to know how to do business, right? We're, we're trained as doctors, not as communicators or not as business people or not as uh, managers or organizational leaders. So as those resources and skills became more available to people, I think some of those fears diminished. So that's really interesting about how the fear of not being able to make a good living because there's too many veterinarians really um, was mitigated by realizing that if you if you cultivate business and communication skills and cultivate an entrepreneurial spirit, there is room for everybody because you're not going to be doing the same thing as everybody else necessarily. Right, That's and it, it's so... And, and it sounds, it may sound a bit trite, but if I had to have a motto for my life, it would be hashtag better together. I really believe that when we understand that we each have value to bring, you know, when you, I think simple numbers, again, it hasn't changed much. When you look at the fact that, I, I don't know what the current statistic is, 50 to 60% of people who own pets never take those pets to a veterinarian. 
there's a, there's a whole, kind of like voters, right? There's a bunch of people that don't vote. There is a whole huge opportunity out there to build our businesses and build our messaging and build our services in a way that's going to attract folks who have never had their animals to a veterinarian before. And to me, that's an issue of public health and animal welfare at the very foundations. And above that, it's a public service and a community service. And it's a really sound way to think about trying to bring new business in and just creative ways of, you know, not everybody's a fit for everybody. So those ways of making ourselves stand out and be unique and work with our talents and our sort of natural gifts and navigate the inherent challenges that we all have helps us get there, I think. And, and working together, I think it's us there faster and better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we're going to get to that because right now you're touching on some of the things that uh, you do for your uh, consulting business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I definitely want to get there. But first, I'd like to go back and talk about um, when you were in veterinary school, did you know what kind of veterinarian that you wanted to become? Did you want to go into <laughs> like research or lab animal medicine or how did you make that decision? So, th so this is a really fun thing about being older and, and not really caring so much about what other people think of you anymore. So I went through various iterations of what I thought I wanted to do. And sometimes that was dependent on who I was dating at the time. So if I was dating somebody that did mixed animal practice, I was like, oh, that might be fun. We could do mixed animal practice together. Um, so, so it, it changed, you know, when I was undergrad, I had applied at the same time I applied for vet school, I was actually told by the admissions officer, one of the admissions officers at UC Davis that I would not get into veterinary school and I didn't have enough experience. So, which was interesting because I worked at Marine Land for an equine vet, for a bovine vet, for a small animal practice and a research lab. So I don't know exactly what they were looking for. So of course I was concerned and I'm really interested in molecular genetics, so applied for a PhD in molecular genetics. Long, separate story, kind of me too story around that that I won't go into now, but ultimately went to vet school. I didn't, I think I had focused at the end of, end of vet school on really wanting to do oncology, internal medicine and oncology. Ended up doing an internship. And then because of life circumstances, met a guy during my internship, got married, who was a nuclear engineer, we couldn't really go much of any place. And where I was living at the time, it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, to do a residency. So that got sidelined. And I'm, I'm not particularly upset about it. I love my life and everything that's that's gone before. So it worked out great. So the truth is, I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do in my profession. <laughs> that's how it goes, right? If we're honest, that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> it's true. I mean, there are just so many opportunities. Right. Yeah, it's it's hard to just choose one thing. I don't think we should. Right. <laughs> but so okay, so you went from veterinary school into a into a rotating small animal internship, I presume. Correct. Washington State University. Washington yeah. State. Okay. And so and that and that's where you got a lot of uh, experience, I presume, in emergency and critical care. Right. So I was the lucky one. We, we run four week rotations for 24 seven emergency and critical care for a week. And you know, at, the, at the time, though, I have to say, Washington State University didn't have a screaming busy caseload like my friends at Washington or at Michigan State University or Minnesota or AMC or something like that. So, but I hit every full moon and I'll just tell you, having done ER and critical care for a lifetime, there is actually a thing apparently for me about full moons. I was so busy. I was in that hospital almost the entire time during those weeks that I was on. So saw a ton of cases. They were very different from what I'd seen in California and at Davis in some ways, developed incredible skill sets and had fabulous partnership and mentoring and challenges from the from the clinicians that I was working with. And sometimes in the students, sometimes the students were my biggest sort of self-control and ethical challenge. So lots of lots of great opportunities during during that internship. Uh, okay, so. I must hear more about this. So first of all, 24-7 for a week. What I don't how how is this? I, it, it's just it's just how things were done back then. So you know during the day when you're in clinics, then cases would come in, and if you were on call, depending on if they were direct refer, referral to the surgical department or internal medicine or ophthalmology or whatever, they're, they're managed that way. But sometimes the cases were not stable, 
very similar to private practice. Sometimes the cases weren't stable or, you know, they came in very unpredictably or somebody would call with a transfer and the only way to get them into the clinic was through the ER service. And so we would manage that and then coordinate both with the referring practitioners, which I love, as well as with the clinicians in the hospital and the students and the residents and, and other interns. So it's a lot of fun. But you were, you were on 24-7. Like how, did you only sleep in spurts of two hours at a time or? It, it depended. I mean, sometimes I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, you know, nothing would come in during the daytime. And sometimes I would have evenings where I wouldn't get a call where I actually had to go in or, or it was early in the evening and I'd come back and get several hours of sleep. I, I think I had already been doing, you know, when I was in vet school, I was getting up to start work at four in the morning and then go to class and then go to class. And then I would do an elective business course in the evening. So I was already used to sleeping well, but not much, I guess maybe that was the best way, best way to put it. And also just really, doing things recreationally that helped me get away from. So the week that I was on call, I didn't go dancing, but every other week that I wasn't on call, I did go dancing for instance. So self-care. I see. Okay. Okay. And And lots of support. I asked for lots of help. From the attending clinicians and usually, and, and figured out after the first couple of rotations, who was going to be willing to help and who was not, and who was actually as a test going to kind of throw obstacles in my way. So that was, it was a very interesting dynamic and, and, and common to a lot of the colleges. Yes, yes. So tell me about some of these challenges. Can you give some specific examples about the challenges you had with some of the professors? So one professor, uh, one clinician, uh, didn't think I was quite humble enough and, and indicated to me that the, when they were in my similar, my same position when they were younger, that they were terrified and they didn't have any self-confidence and that I wasn't humble enough. And at the same time, when I would go and ask for help, they would say, don't bother me until you've exhausted absolutely every other opportunity. And often I was asking them, I didn't, I was raised by a dad. We didn't ask for help unless we couldn't figure it out or do it on our own. That was sort of a mandate. So I explained that. I said, I'm not going to bother you. I'm very respectful of your time, but I really need help. I need help on this case, and I need it right now. And sometimes that help wasn't forthcoming. So then I could go to other clinicians and say, hey, I'm in a bind. Could you help? And it's not like a secret, right? Unless those people are new to um, a job. Everybody kind of knows everybody's ways of doing things. So if I had known then at the beginning what I found out afterwards, I probably would have talked to a few people that had been in my shoes before that and said, who are the people that, are gonna, that I need to watch out for be my obstacles? And where do I find allies who are really going to give me that collaborative support that I'm looking for? Interesting. Yes. And that's a really good piece of advice for... Um future veterinary students if they're interested in going into internships or right. any so, job really any job, jobs. Really. yeah right. yeah talk to the people who had been there before mm-hmm. and 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 find out things like that get a little bit yeah. idea idea of the social dynamics yeah. well what about some of the challenges with the students so you know when you're when you're an intern you're just a, you're, you're you're just fresh out of veterinary school in most cases back then that's how that worked so I had a dog come in, a basset hound, I'll never forget this, lovely family, we're just getting ready to leave on vacation, and somehow the, in the rush of getting ready to go, the dog, they weren't keeping the focus on where the dog was, and they ran over the dog. So the dog came in with severe thoracic trauma and was in shock. So I, I had a lot of pretty good background with emergencies at that point and, and prior things that I'd done. So I knew I had to get this dog's blood pressure up, but just enough. And at that time, all of the supplies we needed weren't necessarily in the treatment room. So I would have to sprint down the hall with my keys for central supply and get the supplies that I need and get the animal started on something. So I left this dog with some veterinary students. We got the catheter in, put the IV fluids on, and I said, okay, he needs a bolus of this many fluids. When it gets to this point, if I'm not back, just turn it off and I'll be back. Well, I came back and the entire leader of fluids had been run into the dog. And the dog and, and the dog was in severe distress anyway, so I'm not sure this killed him. 
but certainly the fluid overload probably didn't help a dog with pulmonary contusions. Oh, God, yeah. And he, of course, the bloody, sloppy foam, and uh, he ended up he ended up dying. And I got pretty upset and talked to this veterinary student. So, frankly, I'm a pretty nice person, but I was upset. I said, what part of, did, did I miscommunicate or did you misunderstand because we can't have this happen again? I told you to give whatever it was, 400 mils of fluids, and then turn that off and keep the oxygen going. What part of that didn't, get, didn't you get? And he said, you're just, you know, you're just right out of that school. And in our class, they told us 90 mils per, whatever it was, 90 mils per kilogram per hour is a shock dose. And I did the calculation and that's what the dog should get. So that, that cookie cutter way of doing medicine, right? That you can do that, but you gotta look at your case. And if they have pulmonary contusions, you're not gonna see them load them that way. So I had a little conversation about listening to somebody and how, frankly, it was it was my reputation, my responsibility, my liability caring for this case. And I had given him sound advice and I explained why. And he continued to, you know, to contend that I didn't know what I was talking about, that his professors said that the standard 90 mils per kilo rate was accurate. And I said, why, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna not listen to somebody and you're gonna kill animals with your thoughtlessness why are you a veterinarian? And he said, for the money. I know, right? And, and then I got a clue as to maybe, this sounds really judgmental, but as his intellect, that if he really thought he was going to get rich as a veterinarian, that that maybe played into his ability to navigate the nuances of medicine. And that proved to be the case. This was a student that I followed to the rest of his career, and he was just somebody that probably never should have been practicing medicine. But once you're in, everybody graduates, right? Wow. That's so, terrifying. It was pretty awful. And unbelievable insubordination. You're a fourth year student. You you listened to the intern. He was actually a third year student just starting his clinical rotations. Oh, and my. and I think the thing I learned there, I didn't realize the mama bear that would come out in me when my patients were being harmed. And I had I, I saw a side of myself with regard to the need for self-restraint that I had never seen before. So really understanding that I was capable of a degree of aggression that I'd never seen before was, was kind of frightening to me. I had to, I had to literally step back and, and stop myself so I didn't do something regrettable. It's pretty, pretty interesting self-discovery and all of that. Indeed, indeed. And I had very similar experiences. I did not do an internship, but I went directly into ER medicine after med school. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I wasn't working with third or fourth year veterinary students and having that kind of problem with them, I was working with support staff who, you know, a lot of times they felt like they knew better than the new grad doctor sure. coming out of veterinary school. And um uh, or maybe they didn't, you know. I was saying, or sometimes they do too, right? Sometimes, sometimes they, they do, do. Know, but and, and we give them the benefit of the doubt. But but uh, sometimes they don't, and and mm -hmm. uh, I I remember feeling a level of <laughs> rage that right. I had not experienced before, and uh, I I did not know how to handle it. Well, and so interesting you say that because rage is is one of those things that can really overwhelm us because we're not working from our higher cognitive functioning at that point. Uh -huh. So yes. understanding, I think what I realized in that moment was the physiology, the, the felt senses that happen before the behavioral aspects, behavioral yes. responses. Yes. And, to, and if I could focus on that, just calming myself down and, and now again, letting that dissipate a little bit, then things were going to be safer for everybody. That, that, was, that was one of maybe four or five times in my life where I really wanted to act out physically. And I'm, I'm, I'm a pacifist, so yeah, that, that made me understand that we're all capable of, of certain behaviors that aren't so pretty. Indeed. And I love this advice about paying attention to what's happening in your body because that is how you recognize what is about to happen. That's your opportunity to stop it from happening. Pain. And I think it gives us different information than we get from our minds, right? Yes. So. Indeed, indeed. And I'm just learning to do that. It's a it's, um, <laughs> really, really important skill, though. Yeah, you do. I agree. You do it first in your body, and then you have to think, okay, this is what's happening. It's a stress response. I need to take a deep breath and calm myself down. 
before. And there's some really great validated frameworks for learning. That is a skill that everybody can cultivate. Mm -hmm. So if you want some reference for that, I'm happy to, to send it to you that separately. That'd be great. I'd, I'd really appreciate okay. that. Okay. So then um, with all this great experience in emergency and critical care, is, and did you end up going and working in an emergency hospital after that? Or did you go into GP? Because you worked for several, for several years as a companion animal practitioner before you started mm -hmm. doing all this other cool stuff. Can you right. talk about that? So I started, so the answer is yes and yes. I did both general practice and ER critical care. So with my background out of the internship, I came to a part of Washington State, uh, west across Puget Sound from Seattle, where there really was, were very, there was very little access to classic emergency and critical care. And because I loved it, there was a group of veterinarians that shared on call for on call services for the area. And two of them, two of the three, let's see, three of the four doctors didn't, so me and two of the other doctors took some of the calls. And then the fourth doctor said, Would you take mine for me? And then eventually one of the other doctors. So I ended up taking my calls and calls for two of the other doctors. So again, the 24 seven after we were closed, you were on call and we'd go in and see cases and things like that. And part of it, frankly, was for the money, but part of it was, I just loved it. And then after that, I, I opened a, uh, one of the first health call practices in the area. So there was a lot of emergency and ambulatory practice related, related to that. And then very shortly after that, I started working in emergency practices in the area and did that for most of my career. Huh. So your house call practice, I mean, that was uh, that was your first step into veterinary entrepreneurship, right? It was. Yeah, it was on the advice of a friend uh, who had done that in another area and got great advice from her on how to go about doing that. And it was a huge service to to the community as well. A uh, number of um, people that didn't have access to driving or, or didn't have the physical ability to move an animal when it had been injured or had so many animals that they couldn't get. I mean, sometimes I felt like I was practicing poodle herd health. I worked for, I worked for breeders and uh, it was, it was pretty fun and a different way of getting to know people and see the environment that the animals are in. And they tend to be, less intimidated like as they would be in a clinical setting. So having to understand the nuances of reading animals and how they wanted to be handled and how to build relationships with them and their owners in a home setting versus a clinical setting was very interesting. Very interesting. Mm, mm. And so am I understanding correctly that like you were doing house call practice, but you were you were doing general practice and you were making emergency house calls as well. So I was, when I transitioned to doing the house call practice, I was doing house call practice, a little bit of locums, GP work, and then emergency work. And at that point, emergency clinics were open like 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. So until I think the late 90s, there really weren't a lot of 24-hour facilities. And then as soon as the facility I was working at the time went 24 hours, then I got to change to some daytime shifts, which is great after working 16-hour overnight shifts for like 15 years. So, oh, my so. gosh. Wow. I don't even understand. Like, uh, okay, are you a workaholic? <laughs> so so this is, this is actually an important point. So at that point, and this is self-disclosure, and I, I don't think my former spouse would have any problems with me revealing this because we've navigated this and he knows I do the wellness work. So at the time we were in marriage counseling and the counselor said to me, okay, I want you guys to go home and write down how many hours a week you're working and a, a small synopsis of what you were doing. So... We came in, and I think at the time, Dave, my husband, was working 60-ish hours a week, and I was working 70 to 90, and we had, a, we had a, small, a small child at the time. So we came in, and she looked at everything, and she said, well, you can do one of two things. You can change your lifestyle, or you can change your expectations. And she said, you know, when you work this much at jobs, Dave is still a nuclear engineer working on uh, power plants on nuclear vessels. She, she said, with a degree of 
cognitive functioning that you need to engage in your jobs and the number of hours that you're working, by the time you get home, you're not going to have a lot of higher cerebral functioning left to navigate what you have to do to maintain and have a healthy relationship. So, yeah, something's got to change. And that was, that was good advice. So as I go along, when I look at inevitable problems and balance in my life that come up, I remember her saying, well, you can change your lifestyle, or you can change your expectations. And that's been, that's been a really wise sort of little meme for me to, to guide what I do with. Not that I do it effectively. I loved what I did. I loved what I did. I'm an extrovert. It fed me. I, I loved having kids. I'm not going to say it wasn't stressful, but it was stress that felt okay and, and good to me. My older son had a lot of health problems. I think that was more stressful than, than just about anything. But we had fabulous, fabulous child care. And I, because I was gone most of the time nights when my son was sleeping, I had, a, I had a lot of quality time with him, but a lot of people that did day practice weren't able to have. And he went on house calls with me and, you know, held up IV bags and played with people's farm animals. It was, it was pretty cool. Right. Wow. Wow. You must have loved what you were doing because you were doing a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty fun. Yeah. So, I, but I love that advice. You can change your lifestyle or you can change your expectations. <laughs> very, very clear cut. Make something that otherwise might seem overwhelming and impossible to navigate through a lot clearer. Yeah, short and simple works best for me. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Me too. Okay, and then, so, at, at, at some point, what was it, like 15 years into your career as a practicing <laughs> clinical veterinarian, is that when you started doing some consulting work? And, and, and what led to that? So the consulting work, so I had been doing organizational leadership, mostly in the veterinary profession, all during this time from the time I left that school throughout my entire career. So what came up was through connections I made there in the broader profession, I started doing technology consulting, and that was for a veterinary software developer. I was the one that was helping specialty and emergency clinics to navigate the change from paper medical records to computerized and electronic medical records, not so much developing the macros and, and all of that, but how did they want their medical records to look? What did they want to achieve with those, whether it was automatically generated referral letters or client letters, client informational letters. And that's where I first noticed the stress that people were experiencing by a big change that was being kind of dumped onto them on top of a bunch of other stressors. So the technology consulting is what got me most interested in doing the social and behavioral science stuff. Uh, so we can talk more about that if you want. But it was, yeah. it was, tech, it was tech consulting. Excuse wow. me. Oh, my microphone here. You know, and this is something that I'd like to ask because um, I remember in my veterinary class, before we started our courses in first year, uh, Virginia Tech Myers-Briggs tested us. Mm-hmm. And most of us were introverts. Right. Very common. And, yes, it is. It is very common. And I'm just wondering if the extroverted personality type might have a more effective way of dealing with some of the stressors uh, that we that we face in this career. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I only, I mean, I've studied that quite a bit with the, the leadership and organizational work I do. I, I, I've only lived my own experience. I can say that I derive energy from interactions with other beings. So I would be one who going into an exam room almost every time would feel like I was opening up a present. Who's going to be in there? What's the animal going to be like? What are they going to be like? What am I going to learn? You know, all of there, a lot of excitement around that. And my introverted friends sometimes, A, thought it was crazy. And B, they had a different, like an anxiety around going in because it took energy from them to have to have those interactions. And I'm, I'm speaking in generalities with things that friends of mine shared with me when we had the discussions about the Myers-Briggs typing. I think the other thing we forget about Myers-Briggs, though, but there's things about our perception and our judging and and 
I think a lot of that perceiving and, and how much of that or feeling and how many other tendencies there are challenges and gifts that we come prepackaged with that it's more than just being an introvert or an extrovert. And I think sometimes there's more focus on that and not enough focus on what those other things are. And there's a whole bunch of other different ways of looking at the essence of who we are and identifying challenges that, that I've used through the years. And Myers-Briggs, I think if you study it a lot and understand how to navigate it, it can be helpful, but I think just knowing what you are is of limited utility. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but I, uh, in general, I think being an extrovert when you've got to work with people or crowds, obviously, I think there's an advantage to that. Sure. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about the numbers of the number of hours that you are working. Right. Um, uh, for, you know, personally, as an introvert, that's what's difficult for me is the number of hours that I have to be interacting with other people without getting sufficient time to be alone and recharge versus somebody who's taking energy from that and can keep going and going and going and, and feels ever more energized by it. That was just what I was well, and just another observation about that. So I think, you know, they say as we sort of mature along that personality spectrum, but ideally where we hope to get a sort of more towards center, not extreme extrovert or extreme introvert in three years, I've certainly come more to center on almost all of those subtests of the Myers-Briggs. So extroversion is also an easy way, extreme ext extroversion, which is why displayed early on, is also a way to avoid some of your self, your, your own self-reflection and self-care and just quieting down and being mindful and being present. And I'm aware of how my extroversion prevented me, I think, early on from being able to address some really important things that had resulted from my childhood that were traumatic that I could have been better served in resolving. So now I'm far, I, I have far more introverted tendencies as far as what I need to do to take care of myself. Lots of downtime, quiet time, time in nature, that sort of thing. Very interesting. That's the flip side. How fascinating. <laughs> well, it's for me. I don't know about anybody else, but, that's, no, but that it, was it, it for me. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. All right. So, and so you mentioned that, all right, so you started your consulting with technology and mm -hmm. um, you were like in technology adoption. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And then how did that turn into, that's when you first recognized the stressors, uh, the, the amount of stress that veterinarians or other people working in vet med were under, and you decided that you wanted to be able to help in that space. So when I was doing the consulting, it was fairly common that people were, were getting pretty stressed by the adoption of this program. Things as simple seemingly simple as where are we going to place the keyboards and computer monitors? Where are we going to place uh, in, in the exam rooms? Are we going to use them in the exam? So all of the logistics around setting that up and developing the program, I think part of the beauty of the system and part of the challenge with the system that I was working with at the time is it was, it was partially built, but it was highly customizable. So there was a lot of work people had to do to get the software portion of it working in a way that, that was good for them without really the understanding. So it was a huge learning curve and, and that was a stress. So what happened was people were coming to me and saying, you know, they were melting down and I would, they would start sharing their life stories with me and their disappointments and their, their bewilderment over where they were. And these were, these were accomplished people. These were surgeons and ophthalmologists and wildlife specialists and you know, critical care docs. These are, these are highly trained people who were absolutely bewildered by where they were at in their lives and also a lot of organizational and institutional dysfunction. So I was being asked to go and do consulting to help navigate that. And number one, I didn't have the skills. And number two, I didn't have the desire. It was really clear at that point that delving into the middle of an organizational dysfunction was not something that I felt equipped to or wanted to do. But I knew I wanted to help and I knew there was a huge need for it. And I think I'd experienced some of that myself. So it took about one, two, three, three years of talking to friends outside of the veterinary profession, a few inside, but mostly outside the profession, 
I looked at life coaching. I looked at organizational leadership and development. I looked at mental health counseling. And ultimately, it was a random conversation with a dear friend of mine who's a massage therapist and, and part of my, I'll just say, spiritual and existential community who said to me, have you ever thought about spiritual direction? I have no, because I've never even heard of it. What is that? So she told me a bit about it, and I investigated, and and that's how I started doing this work. I, I took a program, a two-year program in what they call spiritual direction formation, which is basically a foundation for deep, deep listening and companioning people in their existential and spiritual searches, the fundamentals of how they make meaning and orient to themselves and the world and relationships. And it was amazing. Two years of just extreme discernment, which happened at a very pivotal point in my life because uh, I was in that course with this great cohort of students. The year that both my mother and father died, we lost a colleague. My son went to college, husband in a car accident, son almost died, was expected to die of mono, and, my, and then um, my mom died towards the end of that year. So I had this incredible support and learned the importance of the ability to go deeply, to listen to what's important with ourselves, but also cultivating that social support around ourselves. So that, you know, I'm careful about how I mention that when I'm working at higher levels of global development or with government, but that has been the single best foundation for me really listening and being able to companion people and help them with what they with what they care about. And organizations as well. People believe there's sort of an entity, um, an energetic entity in an organization that's the, the sum of the individuals and the work that's being done. So sometimes that needs some attending and some companioning as well for lack of a lack of a better description. So so then I went on from there, did an additional year of that, and then I went on uh, from there with the thanatology and the compassion fatigue education and some other stuff. Interesting. And were you intentionally deciding that you didn't want to do clinical practice anymore or did something? No, 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 no. Love clinical practice, was still practicing, had intended to practice to some point or another until, until literally when I decided I wanted to retire and do nothing. And some, some circumstances had prevented me from being able to continue practicing. But no, I had every intention of continuing practice and did during that time that I was studying. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, okay. So then tell me about some of this work that you do um, in, in, in this space with compassion fatigue and, and like what year was this when you were first getting involved in, in trying to help people in this industry with compassion fatigue? So I think that probably we started looking at wellness issues. I'd have to go back and look. I think we started looking at wellness issues in the Washington State Veterinary Medical Association. And that was Dr. Jean Jensen that started that effort many, many years ago before it was even a thing. The subject of compassion fatigue as a separate body of research really just started in the very early 90s with uh, Dr. Charles Figley. So there, there wasn't, to my understanding, a, a term for it then, but I did understand the concept of caregiver wellness and challenge based primarily on what I was seeing in my own profession through my work, but also in talking to friends of mine in other care providing professions, and then of course through the tech consulting. So I started having these conversations and trying to work on it in the Washington State VMA pretty early, late 90s, early 2000s. And then I've been really fortunate to be one of the kind of thought leaders in subject matter, I don't like the word expert necessarily, subject matter um, facilitators around the wellness issues. And that's included work with AVMA and the future leaders in getting that initial wellness initiative going and being on some of the so American Association for Veterinary or Association for American Veterinary Colleges and some other efforts, some international efforts on care provider wellness. So it's been a long time, and and bringing in stuff from other disciplines, from from the death, dying, loss, bereavement realm, has been really helpful as well. Because I think at the end of the day, it's about those transitions and that that oscillation back and forth between. Um, loss and expectation and frustration and renewal and all of that, all of that lovely, messy, challenging stuff that 
pulls together all those disciplines. So anywhere anybody's providing care, we're at risk for that sort of compassion stress. Compassion fatigue isn't inevitable. Compassion stress probably is. We're going to, we're going to encounter that. But whether we truly develop compassion fatigue, and I know there's a lot of debate about is it moral fatigue, is it ethical fatigue, that research hasn't been done. Compassion fatigue research is, is pretty well established now. Mm-hmm. So I tend to stick with that terminology just because that's where right now the biggest conversation is happening. Mm-hmm. And so is this when um, the, the I'm sorry, what is the name of your current consulting company? Lejeune Consulting. Lejeune Consulting. Is this around the time when you, you founded Lejeune Consulting? So I had a consulting business that I had not named. I, when, I, when I established my business in Washington State, I just called it House Calls. And so that, that was just mainly I had to have something to call it to pay my taxes. And so it, it was later on after my father died, he, my father, after he retired from the, F, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, started a private investigative firm with two other gentlemen uh, called Lejeune Consulting, or excuse me, Lejeune Investigations. My sister resurrected that. And then I think in, uh, in a way of honoring what I had gotten from my parents, that was a foundation for me doing things I loved. I was looking for a name and I thought, you know what, I'll check with my sister, see if she doesn't mind if I use the name for my consulting business. So that's, that's how that happened. And I don't remember the year that I actually officially took on the, the, the name Vision Consulting, but I was doing the consulting work before, before that. Okay. Now this is where um, I get a little bit overwhelmed because it sounds like the work that you do now for Lejeune Consulting is is so diverse, is mm-hmm. so broad. You're doing policy work, you're doing corporate consulting, you're advising um, nonprofits and NGOs, I presume. Mm-hmm. Um, you're traveling all over the world. You're working in. Um, you're, you're working on topics such as compassion fatigue, but you're also uh, advising in biomedical research. Like, can you can you help me understand? <laughs> like how? So how so, is your so here's the structure. Yeah. Why? So some days the, day, the days aren't structured at all. So the, so the background in emergency and critical care, I think, served me well because honestly, I think that some days they're just not structured. It, it, it depends. And so you're triaging. You know, it's all it, as somebody as I, I tease my kids, they they say that I have a ooh shiny or oh squirrel kind of orientation to life. And it was a student that I was mentoring at the quest of her dad recently when we were going through all this, and she says, Oh. I'm so glad to have found another multi-potentialite. Uh, and I said, what? So she told me a little bit about that. And there's some, there's something out there called the Putty Tribe. And there's some TED Talk, I guess, about multi-potentialites. Yeah. So, you know, when I'm having to give my little 15 second intro, if I'm doing global health or international development or, or international wildlife trafficking and poaching and conservation or whatever, peace building, I have to come up with a way of, drawing all this stuff together and how it makes sense. And I do that pretty seamlessly because it truly is all deeply, deeply connected. When I was in, so I I got a certificate in thanatology, which is the death, dying, bereavement. And there was a very specific reason I wanted to do that, which probably isn't really relevant to this conversation, but nonetheless, and I was sitting in a conference in Montreal, listening to Stephen Lewis, who was a former uh, UN Special Envoy for HIV AIDS to Africa under Kofi Annan. And he was speaking about international trauma and bereavement and loss and compassion fatigue in people who are living in countries where there's been horrible crisis and violent conflict and that sort of thing. So he was talking about Darfur and Iraq and, and Liberia and Sierra Leone. And he said, so people were saying, we spoke very passionately, him and another couple of people, about what the rest of the world was experiencing and, and what the need was. And of course, people wanted to do something and contribute. And he said, well, you know, these governments are corrupt. You can't send money. If you can, it's got to be done in a specific way through established charitable foundations in the UK. And people, you know, 
cash out money and carry cash into these countries. And so that, so understanding the lay of the land was quite an eye opener. And he said, but there will be a few of you in this room who will go to these places and help build that capacity for self-care and trauma mastery with the folks on the ground who are going to remain and do the work after you're gone. And I remember saying, so first of all, I may still be the only veterinarian in the Association for Deaf Education Counseling at the, at the time was the only, the first one who had been certified in phantology. And I remember sitting there thinking, that's going to be me. But it was this, it was this closely held, precious little secret that I wasn't exactly ashamed of, but I, but I, I, I heard the voice saying, who are you to think you can do this work? And the other voice saying, you can do it if you find the right people and circumstances and, and get the information and education you need and experience to do it. So that was 2008 in Montreal in April. You probably remember the day, it's in my calendar. And subsequent to that, I started reconnecting, <coughs> excuse me, with a friend, a classmate from veterinary school who had just taken over Veterinarians Without Borders and had mentioned to him that if he needed help with the organization, that I wasn't fluent in livestock or even international development for, for, for that matter, but very steeped in strategic planning and organizational development and volunteer recruitment and all of those things that you need to run an organization, social media, all that sort of thing. And volunteer organization, I love startups and great working with startup initiatives and organizations and projects. And so it unfolded from there. And the first place that Veterinarians Without Borders was doing his work was in Liberia, which had just come out of 14 years of horrible, horrible civil war. So that was a place, a uh, very steep learning curve on the international development and, and relearning the livestock, of course, livestock animal health and, and transboundary animal diseases and such. But that was the place that I got to take everything that I worked on and combine it in, in a very novel way in developing countries. And still some of my most rewarding work and the work that I'm proudest of. Amazing. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I'm wondering is there's there's the nonprofit stuff that you do and, and it sounds like the stuff that you're doing in uh developing world uh or, you know like liberia this was volunteer work you weren't making any money from it and then on the other side what funds your ability to do that kind of work is the corporate consulting and uh policy advising is is that right well so yes and no so yeah so yes and no so first of all consulting is not for the faint of heart and and consulting isn't all that i do so i maintain a i, ma I maintain a portion of what i do for pro bono work so I, I do pro bono advising for congress and i do pro bono advising for a couple of ngos internationally in the u.s and then also I reserve a little bit of time for pro bono mentoring for students. Usually that's somebody that's sent to me by a chancellor or a dean or somebody that they see that's particularly promising. And then, of course, just going about my everyday activity. I also do career coaching and um, I, I hate to use the word life coaching, but that's essentially what it ends up being. And the, and the, the spiritual direction, existential piece of that by happenstance always seems to get woven in because people are trying to make meaning of what they're going to be doing with their lives. So there's a portion of that that's individual counseling and coaching and consulting and mentoring. And then there's the organizational piece to that. And I actually have been paid for my international work. So after, after my fellowship in Congress, so the Congress work was the congressional work was a paid fellowship. And then I worked for some universities and some corporate clients and uh, for the Department of Defense paid to run programs, international, multinational programs internationally. So it's a combination of a number of different things, which is perfect because I love variety. I can see that. But, but, it's, but, it's, but, but so here's the thing to know about consulting as well. And I moved from D.C. back to the West Coast, so it's, it's far more difficult to stay connected in that international development, global health community from the West Coast than it is from the East Coast. And I'm still in that transition. And the thing to know also is that, so for, for some of the consulting, I still do a lot of consulting in veterinary medicine for businesses and organizations around wellness and culture of safety 
and high risk uh, enterprises and high reliability organizational principles. So a lot of things to make things safer and more profitable and have employee retention and uh, satisfaction for clients and practitioners. So that's a piece of what I do. Mm. But at the end of the day, to me, it's all about improving health and well-being for people and animals and stewarding the environment along the way. It's really simple. I have a life mission that I try to stick to. And, and when I help people develop mission statements, that's the place where we contain what it is we're going to do. And I, when I'm advising organizations and they want to do a project, we have to do that test. Well, does that fall within your mission? And if it doesn't, do you really want to do it? Should you be doing it? Or is it time to revisit your mission and readjust that? So I try to practice what I preach. Sometimes I get off on tangents, but pretty much I try to stay within what my life's mission is. Huh. I, I'm just sitting here thinking, I feel sorry for your bookkeeper. <laughs> my bookkeeper is me and it's not that complicated. It's not that, it's not that complicated. And, and when it gets complicated, then I've got a bunch of great people lined up and my bookkeeping's not that complicated. Yeah. Wow. Now, there is something that I wanted to ask you about, and this was based on um, uh, looking at your CV. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about working with uh, uh, veterinary hospitals in conflict resolution. Um, and is that related to culture of safety? Is that like a, a feeling of social safety or am I... Am I so, so that's sort of, that's sort of a bit of a pyramid. So Veterinary medicine has been identified at, in two ways high risk. High risk for, it's one of the top 10 most dangerous professions by one of the most recent assessments. So personal injury, exposure to chemicals, infectious diseases, all that sort of thing. And then it's also a high risk enterprise in that there's a lot that you can't control, that's unpredictable, and the the risks are high and the potential for harm are high, morbidity, mortality, disability. So my focus is how do we, and, and we know in human medicine that medical mistakes are now the third leading cause of death. So, so that, that, that surpassed pulmonary disease. So that's a big deal. I have no reason to think that that's any different in veterinary medicine. So if our first bioethical mandate is do no harm, what are the things we can do to get that in place? And then I'm working very practically from a business standpoint. How do we reduce liability claims? How do we retain employees? How do we make sure that people are firing on all their pistons with regard to their cognitive function and their ability to work well with others so that we can be effective and efficient and safe in what we're doing? So I start first with that concept of culture of safety, which is founded on, for me, two things psychological safety, and I'll touch on that a little bit, and then principles of high reliability organizations, and that, that can be a longer discussion. But so psychological safety, and, and the other piece of this I should mention, one of the strongest foundations, and it's one of four core clinical skills that rarely gets mentioned, medical communication skills are critical, and they're, they're outcome-based, and, and we know that if we're using a validated framework and skills, that we have better outcomes, uh, less stress for providers and slash patients. This was like that mostly in human medicine, fewer misdiagnosis, better information more quickly, and the list goes on. So anything I'm using is highly validated. I've adapted some of it with the support and permission of people who have developed a lot of these frameworks to work in different areas, such as the such as the international work. But but what we want to do is. You know, hierarchies are good for certain things. So if there's an emergency or disaster, we need that, that chain of command. But beyond that, leveling that playing field and empowering people to speak up, to see something, say something is, is really important. And it has to be backed up by and demonstrated by leadership. So culture of safety means training people to fluency, providing them the resources they need, the equipment, the assistance, the time that they need to do what they need to do. And leadership demonstrating fallibility and self-reflection and being rewarded for speaking up when that's a risky thing to do and, and demonstrating that reward so that if you speak up, 
and some and, and you're doing it in good faith that you think there's a problem and there's not a problem you're still rewarded for speaking up and saying and somebody says to you hey thank you i'm so glad that wasn't an issue but if it had been it would have been really important that you spoke up hmm. and and helping management understand and leaders understand that you can't just speak to your concern about safety for the people that you're working for and with you have to actually put all of those resources and that leadership in place. And that's the hardest thing. So when I'm asked to come and do a talk on compassion fatigue, for instance, and they have all of these boxes they want to tick with regard to what they hope to accomplish, having a talk for an hour on compassion fatigue is going to be an introduction, but it's not really going to do anything for getting people fluent in how do they navigate that. So I'm pretty honest with people that, yeah, you pay me to do an hour long talk for you, but that's not going to get you where you need to go and then help them develop that or, or give them other resources. So, mm. so to me, it's about, it's about promoting health and well-being. I mean, there's, there's my mission again. What are the things that we can do? And I try to do things that are innovative and novel and that aren't kind of on the leading edge where there's gaps that aren't being filled and fill those with, with the skill sets and the talents that I have. Mm -hmm. Well, in this space, working mm -hmm. with veterinary practices, can you tell me what, in your opinion, what are some of the most common challenges that veterinary practices are facing today in terms of employee retention or, you know, positive cultures? Well, why, so wiser minds and minds speak to that and, and better trained minds and minds speak to that quite a bit. From the point of view of the work that I do, what I believe is that we spend not enough time resourcing ourselves with what we need to navigate the totality of what we encounter if we're talking, you know, if we're talking clinical practice. Let's, let's focus on that right now. So all sorts of things come up when we're practicing. We doubt ourselves. We have things that we can't control. We have relationships that we don't know how to navigate. We have successes that we should be celebrating that we sort of skirt over it because we just expect that we should be good at everything. And when we are good, we don't pause to celebrate that. We tend to, and, and not everybody, but where I see people getting into problems is being self-critical or even if we're, if we have more privilege or more opportunity, or we just by accident of birth happen to be better positioned than some of the people we feel guilty about that and self-flagellate and focus on that when we when we could be looking at how do we collaborate and, and understand that no matter who shows up in our path, they know somebody something that we don't know and they have something to offer us and that it's beneficial to let people help us and offer us things. So I think it's a question of navigating organizations. It's a question of understanding that hierarchies in, in leadership are problematic in some ways and how do we how do we become leaders who are supportive and supportive companions and guides and elders in a way and not so much dictatorial or let's see what I'm looking for or sort of quixotic, right? That, that we say one thing, but we do something else. Mm -hmm. And to also admit that we don't have all the answers and how do we support one another in finding those. And I, I think, and I think the other piece of that is sometimes it's not comfortable to do the work that's necessary. So if it's great to, for instance, have a standard business consultant come in, but if, but if they can't go down and, and look at your individual sort of institutional challenges and, and benefits that you're providing and, and positive aspects of what you're doing and look at that as a whole and come up with a tailored approach. I, I think there's limited progress that's made until we get down to those sort of core issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a really interesting topic, though, um, leadership in veterinary practices, because you could consider that Oh, you know, the practice manager or the practice owner, maybe it's a corporation, whatever, but also the leaders in a veterinary hospital are the veterinarians. And I didn't get any teaching. I didn't, I didn't take a course on, Hey, by the way, when you graduate and start practicing, guess what? You're the leader. Like I had to discover that myself. So 
So, so this is, so I was, again, I think I was really lucky at UC Davis. There was an elective evening course, and I don't remember who, who facilitated this. I think Jim Wilson, the veterinary medicine attorney now, I think he's in Pennsylvania, was, was a seminal part of that course. So we would go one evening a week, and there would be practitioners or lawyers or insurance people or business people coming and talking to us about different skill sets that we would need. I remember one person coming in and talking to us about negotiating employment contracts. And so when I got, so I had, of course, I had a contract during my internship and my first job out was a spectacular seven doctor practice in California with a guy that I worked with in California, BMA. Very welcoming, very clear cut concrete track, very clear expectations on what I would expect if I stayed beyond the first six months. And then when I relocated to Washington State, it was like there were no contracts. There, there was not a lot of honesty about, about what was going to happen. And oh, we'll get your contract and oh, we'll sign it. So, so learning early on some of those skills, lots of, I didn't realize not everybody else had that opportunity, but that was not part of the veterinary curriculum. And I, and I think there's reasons that it's still not a big part of the veterinary curriculum because most of the people in veterinary schools haven't worked in private practice mm-hmm. and been outside of academia. I think it's a little bit difficult for them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the schools bring in people from the outside that are in practice and I give them kudos, but I'm not sure it's the job of the veterinary schools. They got a lot on their plate. To I do know. That. I don't and know I think where they're they're doing, put it in. Yeah. I think they're doing the best that they, the best that they can. So, so yeah. So I was again, very, very, very fortunate very fortunate along the way to have the opportunities that I did and to, and to appreciate those and, and to adopt those and practice those principles and being involved with business. I was in banking before I got into, into veterinary school. And I think having that business background in banking and customer service and navigating people when they were upset about their money gave me good experience for navigating people when they were upset about their animals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, do you have any specific advice to offer future veterinarians in terms of leadership and I don't mean to bash veterinary schools I think they they barely have enough time to teach the things that they need to teach but it's a fact that when you get out you are the leader on the floor at the hospital so I think there's some really simple things I can do and you know to be honest and I get this a lot from people that I'm talking to when I'm doing career coaching for example and, and they get a little overwhelmed when they like when they see things that I do most of my education beyond veterinary school and my internship was, I had to craft it on my own. So it was an online course or it was a series of courses or it was massive open online courses. So you can fashion just about anything you want these days online. I didn't have that opportunity early on because it wasn't available to me. But now you can fashion just about anything you want through online or distance learning with, I mean, even distance learning with occasional on-site cohorts, meetings with cohorts of of classmates or participants in a course. So I think that's part of it. And, And to understand that part of it is you just have to practice. So the single biggest benefit to me was working in organized veterinary medicine and working on committees and working on executive boards and president of the Washington State VMA and working on the foundation and working with stakeholder groups and allied professional groups because that's where you learn persuasive communications and negotiation conflict resolution and give and take and I did a lot with bioethics so learning learning frameworks, actual frameworks that, that are transportable that you can take with you is something called, for instance, strategic academic controversy. I use it a lot to frame discussions around decision making to help contain it and help people be civil one another with one another and find mm-hmm. common ground. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is finding validated frameworks mm-hmm. and, and ways of doing these things and then practicing them and refining them and working with people who have greater skill sets and learning from them. I, I have met, I still have mentors that I work with that mentor me. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, I'm, I'm sure we are all constantly learning and that's part of the fun of life. And the other, and the other advice I would say is look outside of the profession. One of the things I'm concerned about the veterinary profession and others as well, but the veterinary profession for purposes of this discussion 
is that we tend to think we have all the answers from people within the profession, and we just don't. So in the wellness arena, there are people that work on this for a living. They're in the mental health field. They're in the uh, leadership, organizational leadership field. They're in some of the spiritual and existential fields. So, so from that standpoint, business, um, change management, transformational leadership, there's a lot of really cutting edge things going on. And veterinary medicine lags behind in many, many ways. So a lot of professions I work with are probably 10, 20 years ahead of veterinary medicine. And that's just the reality of it. So looking to the profession alone for what we need, I think isn't going to get us as far as we could if we also engage the best of books to offer outside of the veterinary profession as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why is veterinary medicine a decade behind? Because veterinarians are too busy? You know, I think... My my best my my personal experience is that change is difficult. That there's there's a lot going on and change is difficult. The, the profession's gone through tremendous shifts in the amount of knowledge, the type of technology, generations, gender, governance, policy, liability. Uh, there, there's just a tremendous amount of change. And I think if, if you don't want to tip to, to a point where you just can't navigate that, you have to contain the amount of change that you can, that you can hold. And it's, it's been a pretty insular profession. I think one of the reasons I love working with One Health, for instance, is because we're stepping outside of the veterinary profession into working in the environmental realm and human health realm and finding our common ground and, and sharing expertise and understanding and knowledge there. So I think change is difficult. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the, the things that I think we don't do well is help people understand how to navigate change and the tension and the frustrations and the stress around that. Talking about resilience, I think is a really important thing in, in cultivating resilience and hardiness. So when I work with individuals and organizations, I go back to hardiness and resilience and talk and, and, and things like gratitude practices that we know can help navigate that. And I engage again, but these are validated frameworks and validated practices for cultivating hardiness, resilience, um, and, and satisfaction, work satisfaction and safety. Well, so we've had a lot of changes in veterinary medicine to react to. Are there changes that we can foresee that we can be more proactive about? I can't think of anybody with a broader perspective to ask this question. To. I, I was just actually having this, having this conversation. So my, my perspective on the profession is quite different now than it was perhaps 15 years ago. I, one of my concerns, frankly, as much as my background was in pretty high-end, small companion animal, and wildlife and exotics as well, but small, let's just say small companion animal medicine, that my foundations of my education, however, were much broader than that. Somehow, I, I came away between the people that I worked for and, and the curriculum at the time I went through veterinary school with an understanding that small companion owned medicine is a small piece of the profession, is a piece. It might be large from the standpoint of the numbers of people that want care for their animals, but from the standpoint of subject matter, it's, it's actually only, only a small piece of what we do. Mm. And that when we look at, when we look globally at what needs are, we're looking at livestock, we're looking at the environment, we're looking at poultry and fish and all sorts of other things that are going to impact health on the planet and, and where veterinary skills and animal health skills might be necessary. So my, one of my concerns is I don't think veterinary students get enough training about what we talk about being public goods. So public goods are the, the types of problems that arise in animal health where the private sector has, there's no real incentive for them to invest time and resources into navigating those things. So transboundary animal diseases where there's no cure and morbidity might be high and economic impact can be high. 
I think there are things that the veterinary profession needs to be doing to train every veterinary student as a global citizen to be able to understand. Hmm. And if you look at and this is work that, that Corey Brown and Mike Chaddock and some others have done, where they compare the things that the American Veterinary Medical Council and Education accreditation requirements ask that are the competencies for graduating veterinary students and you compare that to the ones for the International Animal Health Organization, OIE. They're, they're very different. So the competencies that international students have outside of AVMA accredited schools are quite different from those that are expected from AVMA accredited schools. Hmm. And Part of a lot of the work that I do is talking to people who want to transition into doing global animal health or domestic public health in the One Health arena, and they don't have the skill set or the knowledge or even where to go to find out about that. And the skill sets are much broader than just the medical knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I was working for Department of Defense in Liberia uh, at the tail end of the Ebola epidemic, I was working with tribal chiefs. And historically, you know, the only white gal that shows up in Africa in program is you didn't get access. So, so my strongest background for that was the cultural, uh, the cultural understanding and agility that I developed, believe it or not, in the spiritual direction formation training program that I have, because that was all about diversity and listening. Mm. And so these other skills, cultural agility, leadership, the ability to listen, the ability to find common ground, stakeholder engagement, and relationship development. These are all skill sets that communication, these are all skill sets that we don't get a lot of in vet school. I think folks that had, for instance, training in the Calgary Cambridge Guides for Medical Communication, fabulous foundation. And please, please, please don't forget about that when you get out. I continue to practice those skills every single day and at least one interaction I have with somebody with 70 some skills so so finding the soft skills and the hard skills outside of veterinary medicine and then also just opening up your, your worldview to yes I'm a small animal practitioner I always had this like really kind of creepy interest in gross infectious diseases from the time I was first out of school so I knew a lot of this stuff before I started doing international work because of personal interest. But say once a week, just read an article about some global health issue mm. or take a couple of global health online short courses that are an hour or two. They're really simple to find that stuff. And broaden your horizons and really try to think about being a global citizen, not just a citizen of the U.S. Hmm. I like the advice. However, the clinicians that I know are so busy. So here's the thing. Did I know when I was a small new practitioner first starting out that I would end up working in Central America for Congress or Thailand right. or Africa or speaking on a panel in association with the World Health Assembly in Geneva as a thought leader on Brazilian health systems? No, 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 no. I didn't know that. So what do you do? And, and nor did I know that I would be skiing and be run over by an out of control snowboarder and suffer a spinal injury that went on to uh, limit my ability to practice. I can't practice clinical medicine anymore. So I think that's sort of the old scouting adage of be prepared. Oh, okay. You know, be curious. Be Take some time to just explore something new and different. And if you're so busy that you can't do that, maybe it's time to step back and reevaluate your lifestyle or your oh, expectations amen. or have somebody help you or have somebody help you do that. And for me, that's been three years for me. That's been counselors and my own spiritual directors. And I do that ongoing as part of my personal ethical obligation. I have to take care of my own stuff if I'm going to be helping other people with their stuff. So that's to me like a lube oil filter, tire rotation kind of thing. You just do your own maintenance as well. Amazing. Well, you've done so many amazing things and you're doing amazing things. What do you have on the horizon? What are you, what are you looking forward to? What's, what plans do you have in the hopper? What's next? Well, so right now I'm vaguely looking at an international opportunity. I'm not sure I'm ready to move out of the country for a couple of years-ish, uh, but that's a possibility. So I'm looking into that right now. I think the main thing I would like to do is conti continue with the international work, but also I love the piece of 
I love the tra- what we call transformational leadership. I love that place where we're transitioning from a more hierarchical, sort of dictatorial, top-down, mm-hmm. power differential-based way of doing things to a place where we're truly cultivating cultures of safety and working on these high reliability organizational principles because it, it decreases stress, it increases satisfaction, it increases safety, it improves yes. outcomes. All of those places where I can take this sort of suite of skills and expertise and, and connections that I have and use that to go that next step and that next level of advancing that health and well being mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for organizations and, and individuals and animals. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I have neglected to ask? or any last words of advice that you would like to offer people who are thinking about going into veterinary medicine, whether they be hoping to become veterinarians or anything else? Well, you know, I I, I sent you that little list. I I think a couple of things, you know, eyes wide open, right? The the debt to income ratio in veterinary medicine can be quite overwhelming, far more overwhelming. I I was pretty overwhelmed when I got out with $26,000 worth of debt way, way, way back then. But we're talking big numbers now, and it's a huge stressor. So learn how to manage your money early on. And frankly, be really thoughtful. It's, it's very easy. You know, if somebody had told me at the beginning of my career, veterinarians don't make a lot of money, I don't know that I would have really had a frame of reference for understanding what that was going to look out like if I came out of school, for instance, paying one hundred fifty dollars or $200,000 of a debt that I had to navigate over 30 years. I... I don't know that I would do that now, frankly. So be thoughtful and then equip yourself early on with great social networks and great avenues towards understanding and managing your own self-care and well-being and resilience. If you can do that and, and be curious and open to opportunities, and the other thing is consider community college. If you're early in your college career, consider community college. It's a great Great investment in your education that costs very little, comparatively speaking. So there you cut down on your educational debt. And if you're going to go to school, go when you're ready. Don't go if you're not ready. My brother's a college counselor and he's counseled my boys and other people. If you're not ready to go and dedicate and do a good job, take a break, go work, travel, whatever. But it's really difficult to resuscitate a bad GPA. And it's going to be, so some institutions are looking for GPA and academic rigor. So it's not just your GPA. It's how difficult was the coursework that you took because they want to be relatively sure that you can advocate a different, a, a difficult professional curriculum. So academic rigor, um, a sense of responsibility, getting good grades. It's, it sounds kind of mundane. And then social networks, social networks, social networks, get that social support that you need to help you get through this. Ask for help and give help and learn limits and boundaries. When when to say yes and no, and that can be hard. We still have to navigate that all through our lives, I think. Well, okay. So back to academic rigor, I just want to um, ask about this. And does doing, say, the first two years of your undergraduate degree at a community college and then transferring to um, a more traditional university, <laughs> that doesn't decrease from uh, your academic rigor points? So in my experience, it does not. However, that's where a skilled counselor will really help you. So with the students that I mentor who are at that stage of their lives, I advise that they talk to both the universities that they think they may be wanting to go to and the community college. So for instance, where my brother works in California, they have uh, sorts of agreements with different universities for how they shape their programs to get other students in. So you want to make sure that you're working with a community college that's got a good relationship and a good reputation for transferability of those credits. When I graduated from, when I left Southern California, so I went to Cal State Fullerton and to Fullerton Community College. My zoology course at Cal State Fullerton, my year-long zoology course there, transferred as a full year plus a semester of an upper division class because I had the curriculum and Davis looked at it and they said, well, this was an amazing course. So I ended up with not just a year of credit, but a year and a half of credit, which I didn't expect, but I was happy. 
So just to be really thoughtful and careful and then talk to other people. And, and if you want academic success, you need to see these great my professors. You know, in that school, you're kind of stuck with who you get, but you can also, you know, you're investing in your education. The, the university, we're the customers of the universities. So you want to get the best value for the money and the time that you're investing. So find out who the good professors are, talk to them, try to interview them, and, and take a look at those rate my professor kinds of assessments and, and try to shape what you're doing around that as well. Mm. Really helpful. Mm. And I loved what you said about it's really difficult to resuscitate a bad GPA because I think, um, and that, that's great advice. If you're not ready to give it all you've got in undergraduate, take a year off, travel the world, whatever. But I, I think that a lot of people get into trouble. They start in undergraduate, they end up with a two point five GPA and then they decide I want to go to vet school and then they end up having to spend more money take more classes get a master's degree so and and I don't and I don't mean to say that it can't be resuscitated but you're right it's more costly on on the other end and and that also goes to you know how do you shape your narrative and how do you shape the discussion during the interview about what happened then and what you learned and how you problem solved and what you iterated and continue to iterate to show that you can handle that sort of academic rigor. And, and you know, frankly, for some people that I work with that, that go to vet schools out of the country, those international experiences turned out to be a better fit for them. And they're some of the finest veterinarians I work with, but boy, the cost is significantly more. That's right. And some people are better positioned to be able to navigate that kind of cost than others. And I think assuming, you know, people come from different economic strata so i happen to come from pretty low economic background uh low economic status background and so i didn't have help from my parents for my education but i think it was easier then to get financial aid than it is now and and i'm just based on what i talked to to students about and what i see with the student dev and what i what i navigated with my own kids so it's very very different circumstances i think the other thing is we don't know how that's going to change in the future so paying attention to those fundamentals of financial you know academic success and financial intelligence and having a broader skill set than just loving animals and wanting to play with them will will stand people in very good stead do you have a favorite charity, Dr. Lajeunesse, that you would like to mention that perhaps listeners can consider donating to to help to you? Thank you for your time and advice. Today. Mm, that's so kind of you to ask. So I have many, but I think the one that springs to mind right now is an organization called Coffee Oasis, and it's local to this Kitsap County community where I live in Washington State. And it's a coffee house where they provide business and training opportunities and resources to homeless youth and they've done a fabulous fabulous job um full disclosure it's a faith-based organization and very cautious around all of that sort of thing but it's a fabulous organization they do amazing amazing things in the community and having come from relative privilege that way and and working with people that have gone through pretty traumatic life experiences both in the u.s and around the world those foundations and supporting our youth who really need the support. That's to my heart is. Okay, lovely. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. And how can people get in touch with you if they would like to learn more about you? So there's a contact form through my website and it's very easy. It's lejeuneconsulting.com. So L-A-J-E-U-N-E consulting.com. Contact form there. I think you've got my email address uh, but that's the same you can post that okay and my phone number is on the website so people can contact me by phone as well okay all right well uh dr carrie lajunas thank you so much for being on the show my pleasure <laughs> thank you so much for doing this this is so you know this way that you're demonstrating how we share knowledge and build community and share resources with one another is so much what we need in the profession. So thank you so very much for what you're doing and for navigating that with your own very busy life. Very <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. You take care and thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye. 
you enjoyed today's show. If you found it helpful, please take a moment to leave a positive review of the Voices of Veterinary Medicine podcast and share this episode with anyone else who may also benefit. And whatever your current interest in veterinary medicine is, and wherever you are on your journey right now, I wish you a magnificent future. Content disclaimer, the opinions expressed in this podcast are those of host or guest alone and do not reflect those of respective employers or other affiliations. Unless otherwise stated, podcast guests and hosts claim no professional training or education in psychiatry, psychology, human nutrition, exercise, physiology, financial or legal matters, human medicine or medical education. Please consult a certified or licensed expert in these areas for professional help. Any advice on veterinary medical practice provided by the author or guests is intended only for application by licensed veterinarians capable of using their own medical judgment. Nothing in this podcast implies or intends to establish a doctor-client-patient relationship, and any information provided about pet care is for entertainment purposes only. For medical advice pertaining to your pets, consult a licensed veterinarian in your area. In no event should the host or guest be responsible or liable directly or indirectly for any damage or loss caused or alleged to be caused by or in connection with the use of or reliance on any information provided in these podcasts. It is the listener's responsibility to research the accuracy, completeness, and usefulness of all opinions and other information provided by the hosts and guests of the Voices of Veterinary Medicine podcast.